I'm in lovely Marianne Key's kitchen in, in Dunleary, just outside Dublin. Marianne, thank you for letting the pool into your lovely thank home. Thank you for coming. I'm so honoured you're here. I love the pool. I, I really, really do. And I, I really, I'm so thrilled to be a little part of it. Thank you. So Marianne, um, the woman who stole my life's out in paperback this week, and it's yes. this week's Bedtime Book Club. Thank um, you. It's vintage Marion, isn't it? It's Marion at top form. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I decided I was going to have fun with this book. Um, you know, because my, the previous book had been very dark about a woman who suffers from depression. And I just, I wanted to be in a light frame of mind. So my character, Stella, which well, is older than any of the other people I've written about, and she's just a very optimistic, upbeat, uh, you know, not a Pollyanna pain in the arse type, but just, you know, like she will always see the good in a situation. And, um, and also I wanted to write about, I wanted to write a love story about what it's like to be a woman who's no longer in their 20s or 30s, but you know, who falls passionately in love um, and is surprised that, you know, those feelings are still readily accessible kind of later in life. And I've always been a bit mortified about writing love stories because I feel, you know, very judged that like, yeah. um, you know, that I won't be taken seriously. But anyway, I thought this time, feck it, I don't care. I'm going to write the book I really want to write. And I want to write about this incredible chemistry between these two people who are like actually very not suited. Um, so I had a great time. I really, really enjoyed writing this book. And given the, the things that happened to Stella, I mean, Stella is one of your, um, you know, an ordinary woman that extraordinary yeah. things happen to. But given the really extraordinary thing that happens to her, the, how do you pronounce it? Guillain Barre? G G well, Guillain I pronounce it Guillain, Guillain Barre disease. But that I think, disease. but it's French, so I think we should be going Guillain Barre. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I don't know how to do that. Pro and yeah. also, I'd feel idiotic you did great. You saying did great. it like that. But yeah, it's a very rare disease. But I'll tell you, about 12 years ago, um, I have two friends. And over the course of a weekend, one of their sisters, who lives in Chicago, got Guillain Barre <laughs> disease. And another friend who lives in Dublin, her dad got it. And it was just the most incredible coincidence. And it's, it stuck with me, you know, because like how random life is and how good things can happen out of the blue and bad things can happen out of the blue. But it's a very strange and cruel disease in that like you shut down everything, like every muscle eventually stops uh, working. And like in Stella's case, only her eyelashes or her eye eyelids <laughs> worked. Uh, yeah, eyelashes, eyelashes are, really yeah, in trouble, yeah. Yes, um, moved. And um, but it's fully recoverable from, um, which... I didn't want to write about something that wasn't. So it was just, it was the right time to write, you know. So she meets this neurologist who uh, she'd actually... Who she's already yeah, accidentally like he, met. Yeah, because she drove her car into his by accident. She was trying to do a good deed, a random act of kindness, and it backfired. Yeah, never do that. No, 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 because I often try to do the random acts of kindness, you know, and my way of doing it is offering people lifts, you know, so I see <laughs> people standing at the bus stop in the rain, and, and I drive up and I think, this is great, they're gonna be so happy. And I say, hop in, I'll take you wherever you're going, and they go, no. No, you are a stalker. Yeah, Scary you're an oddball. And yeah. why would I be getting into your car? God knows, you know, you look small, but you might have, you might have hidden strengths, <laughs> you know, so yeah. But then I suppose I always feel, ah, well, you know, I tried. You tried, yeah. Yeah, so Stella tries this random act of kindness and it backfires, it backfires terribly. But then your man shows up as her neurologist and, you know, they have a very, you know, prickly relationship I suppose because they're very different and they both have chips on their shoulders like she's working class made good and he's posh boy with a lot of family secrets mm. so they have a lot of work to do to kind of find common ground and I mean and she's married and she has teenage children and and actually he's married um, and is going through his own stuff so you know there's a lot yes, to be overcome no it's not yeah. But is it ever? No, exactly. I mean, I think you've, I mean, you said that you wanted this to be a light book, but one of the things I think you're really, you're really amazing at is 
couching darkness in light. So, Thank you. Um, so say this charming man, which is about relationship abuse fundamentally. Um, uh, brightest star in the sky has rape at the heart yes. of it. Yeah. Um, how do you do that? Well, I mean, people say, is it hard to be funny? For me, it's not. I think it's simply, it's, uh, that sounds boasty. It's not meant to be boasty at all. I think it's some sort of default mechanism, a protective thing in me, that I can be serious up to a certain point, and then I simply have to, for my own ability to live in the world, have to bring in humour or lightness without ever trivialising a really serious issue like domestic abuse or, or rape. I, you know, it's, it's a very delicate line to walk. And I work very hard at getting that balance right so that people, I hope my readers really feel the impact of what it is like to be a woman to go through something like that. But at the same time, it's not so dark or dreadful that it doesn't uh, repel them. You know, that I would still offer enough lightness or narrative to keep them mm. involved. To make it in yeah. in enjoyable. So I suppose it's innate, but I do work. I do work. I mean, God, I rewrite incessantly to get the balance right. Oh, how many rewrites? Well, you see, I don't do kind of one full draft and then go back. I rewrite all the time. Like, I, I proceed at a glacial pace. <laughs> you know, I'm very slow because I kind of can't move forward till the previous stuff is as good as it can get. Um, we were talking earlier about speaking human. Yes. And your, I think your book's back in the kind of the dawn of chiclet, which of yes. course we, we don't say chiclet anymore. anymore. Nobody no. likes it. No, no. no, that's not good. <laughs> but back in the dawn, that you were like the first person who wrote human. Thank you, you know, so Who wrote those much. things that were in your head. Yes. Yeah, and it's funny because, I mean, I hadn't a clue. Like, I had no aspirations to be a writer. I'd never done creative writing courses or anything like that. But what I felt was that there were no novels about women like me. Like, this, is, this was 1994 I started writing. And I felt it was all it, those kind of very, well, 80s values of kind of money and power and boardroom takeovers. And um, I was like, you know living this messy life where I earned almost nothing. Like all my relationships were train wrecks. You know, I spent my phone bill money on shoes, you know. You're still doing that. I am still doing that, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that there, even in women's magazines, there was, no, there was nothing that felt like me. There were no people to identify with. So I just thought, I'm going to write a book that I'd like to read. And it's funny because, I mean, being Irish, I mean, we have a national inferior inferiority complex and, you know, we've lived in the shadow of Britain and we've always, I mean, I learned that, like, you know, British things are, are far better. So I'm surprised that I had the courage to write very conversationally um, in Irish slang. And I suppose what I also did was I was really honest about my shameful feelings. Mm. Like, you know, when you have a really lovely friend and you're both a bit fat, and yes. then suddenly she loses like half a stone and then a stone, and like suddenly she's fabulous. And instead of go, and you're going, that's great. But inside you're thinking, no, don't be thin. Yeah, so don't, <laughs> let's be fat together, the fat <laughs> losers together, you know? And so I was able to kind of give my characters those awful thought processes mm. that we, we all have and that we all think we're the only one to have. Um, there's that lovely quote from, is it C.S. Lewis? You know, what, you? I thought I was the only one. What, you yes. too? I thought yes. I was the only one. Yeah. It's that lovely feeling of like, God, you think those awful shameful things too? Let's be friends. <laughs> it's like the scene where Stella thinks her son has shrunk her jeans. Yes. And then she gradually realises it's because she's put on two stone. Yeah. And, um, and the, uh, the whole stuff about the belly and being the belly on legs. And yes. I just think, you know, it's that. Everybody thinks that, but not many people say it. So. Thank you. Well, I suppose, I mean, the, one of the good things and one of the bad things about me is I have no boundaries. I have no, no I haven't. Like, I'm very indiscreet and I, I, I find it very hard to censor myself. 
And so an awful lot of that, I suppose it's great. I'm able to give it to my characters and hopefully then people will identify. Yeah, I think that I definitely think they do. In the, um, Stella, when, uh, I, I don't want to do, if, you, if people haven't read the book, I don't want to talk too much okay. about what happens. But Stella, um, I don't think it's giving anything away to say that when Stella recovers from the French Yeah, illness, unpronounceable disease. Yes, the unpronounceable <laughs> disease. Um, she writes a self-help book called One Blink at a Time. Yes. Um, are you a self-help book lover? I'm completely not. I'm, I am utterly, um, I, I hate anything woo-woo. I hate anything. I hate all this be your best self. Um, there's a sign in some shop on Longacre that says, do one thing every day that scares you. And I think, feck off. I get out of bed. That's scary <laughs> enough, you know. Um, I, I suppose, having gone through so, uh, you know, a very bad spell with depression, and I tried everything. Like I did all kinds of courses. I went to angel channelers. I did cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, you know, I did everything. And it's really put me off at all. I just think now I like to keep things simple. Okay. I mean, I am grateful. I practice gratitude. Like I know that makes me sound fabulous, but, um, but I do because like, I feel so glad to be in good mental health. Um, so I write a gratitude list every night and um, apparently that is one of the things, sorry, that's my fridge, um, <laughs> one of the things that helps, I don't know, people live a, a more grateful, present life. And it's no good to think the gratitude things, you have to write it down. Oliver, the lovely Oliver Burkman um, yeah. in The Guardian said, you must write it down. Um, so I read him now in fairness, but he, he's always recommending books and I, you know, I don't buy them because I think there are no silver bullets. There are no instant fixes. There are no cures for the condition of being human. I think it's far better for me anyway, to stop searching, to call off the search and kind of accept that for me and for most people, life is always going to be like walking along with a stone in my shoe. You know, it, there's always going to be something that dogs me a little bit. You know, I, I mean, I have times when I'm happy, joyous and free, but for most of the time, I am in a state of mild discomfort, mild psychic or emotional discomfort. And I think, I think I spent so long trying to cure myself or fix myself. And now I accept, I fundamentally accept that that is not going to happen and that life is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be lived. Um, so I am vehemently against any snake oil salesman who tells me, that I can, I can be happy all the time. Because it's not, it's not possible. We're human beings, we're not meant to be. What, um, what books do you love? I... You're a mega reader, aren't I you? I am, I am, I am. I mean, I'm very hungry for contemporary um, writing. Um, I'm always interested in what people are coming out with now. I mean, I will always read um, the, the women's prize for fiction shortlist and I'll try and read the long list and in fact I was a, a judge on it I think about seven years ago and it was so fabulous because I had to read something like 150 books it was <laughs> it was just great um I love dystopian fiction um I love so you're reading the bees at the minute I am you? reading yeah. the bees and it is magnificent and really different to anything I've read before um, I love griplet, like this whole, you know, new genre, um, like people like Colette Macbeth, um, her books are great, uh, Claire McIntosh, um, I forget who wrote Disclaimer, it's great, oh, Renee, Renee Knight, yes, yeah, it's yes. really good, um, my mother's just given me one, my mother's mad about them, um, <laughs> yeah, um, why do you think that is, what do you like about it? Well, actually, they're, 
nearly all written by women, apart from one which I will not name because I hated it so much. Okay. And the person who wrote it was clearly a man because he had a woman, the woman in it, wore tights under trousers. And I just thought, would uh, you get a feckin' grip? No, do you know? And she said things that. like, it wouldn't matter how cold no, it was. No, no. And she, she, the, the character says, I expect he'll want me to give him sex. It's like, what? No woman would ever think like that, no or, or in that, that terminology. No one like that. Yeah. Anyway, we, yeah. But most of them are written about women. Um, uh, they're British mostly, apart from Gone Girl, um, and you know their women are very, very ordinary. Um, funnily enough, I mean the the theme that kind of keeps recurring is you know the serpent in the bosom, like the you know, the cuckoo in the nest, like the danger mm. is very close to home. Um, but I just love them because they are devoury books, like, yeah, you know, just once, yeah, you know, it's total escapism, like complete unputdownability, um, which is just, it's just so nice to, where a book does all the work for you. So you, you've mentioned your mum a few times with yeah. regards to book. You live, Five minutes from yeah. your mum no, and dad. Don't yeah, you? yeah. No, when Tony and I first moved back to Ireland, which was a long time ago, about nineteen years ago, we looked for houses all over Dublin. Um, you know, and I suppose I didn't want to come back to where I'd been brought up. Were you in London until? Yeah, then? yeah, yeah. I lived in London for eleven years. But anyway, we looked for houses everywhere, and the only one we could feckin' afford was five minutes from my parents. So, but I mean, that sounds awful because I love being near them. Um, and it's so funny. Um, I suppose Tony thought we might be overrun with them, but it's so <laughs> funny. My mother has been to this house about three times and she comes in and she's very kind of, um, and she sits on the edge of the couch holding her handbag <laughs> and uh, say, relax, ma'am, your grand, settle in, you know? And she goes, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And it's like she's in denial that I've actually left home okay. and that I live in a house so, so of my own. So long as you keep going there, it's yes. fine. Yes, so we go every Friday. You know, there are, I have four brothers and sisters and, and four, four of us live in Dublin. One, my other sister lives in New York. But we all go and we pay obeisance every Friday um, and we have our dinner there and magnums. Magnums. Yeah, yes. and it's really nice. She has the most fabulous freezer, like full to bursting, mostly with magnums. Um, and the odd chicken Kiev. <laughs> yeah. We have to dip round there on our way back to the yes, airport. Yes. yes, I mean, it's a treasure trove and she has many different flavours. Yeah, even the rare, the elusive mint one. <laughs> yes, because I have two nephews, the Redsers, so Reds are the younger, favours the mint magnum and won't eat anything else. And, you know, he, he's a strong-willed young man. So she finds the mint magnums. I don't know where she goes, but obviously she has an in with someone, some dealer. With the yeah, she's got a, yes, she's got a magnum pusher. She does, <laughs> she does, yes. So, I mean, you could live anywhere, couldn't you? I mean, you're, you're so successful, um, you can't be scared. my work is so, portable. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. so what was it that made you come back here, really? Okay, I'm going to be incredibly uh, brutally honest about this. Um, at the time, um, there was a law here that writers didn't have to pay tax. Now, I'm actually very ashamed about that now. I just think it's not on to live somewhere and not pay tax. So the law changed a good while ago, which I'm very pleased about. And now I pay the highest rate of tax there is. And as a self-employed person, um, I actually pay more. Um, and, you know, I would always have regarded myself as left of centre. And it just, it never, I, I did, it was just an idiotic way to live. Um, but anyway, the law changed fairly shortly after we moved here. And I was glad, you know, I just, I want to be part of... Um, the community I live in, and I don't think I have a right to be if I don't pay tax. His home and family and siblings are really big themes in all, of your, all of your books. And um, 
in The Woman Who Stole My Life, Stella is an ordinary woman who leaves and comes back. And leaving and coming back is, is it's a big thing in lots of your books, it isn't is, it? It is, it is, it uh, is. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I mean, I left when I was 22 and when kind of things went off the rails for me with alcohol when I was 30, I came back. So a lot of my characters come back at a time of crisis. Mm. You know, the Walsh family, which is the family that was in my first book, um, you know, there are five siblings in it, the same as there are in mine. Mm. I mean, I have brothers, I mean, um, and the Walshes are all girls. But I suppose the dynamic of a big family is something that I, I mean, I love it. You know, um, I find my family endlessly entertaining and great fun, very supportive. You know, we're, you know, God, every family has their stuff, but you know, we're, we're close. Um, so yes, yeah, so I came back when I was 30 to get fixed. I mean, I went to rehab in Ireland um, and then went back to London. And so yeah, that theme of leaving and coming back is something. And actually I think, you know, it's the truth for an awful lot of Irish people because our economy has been so rocky. It was, I mean, when I left Ireland um, when I was 22, 50,000 other people also emigrated that year. Mm -hmm. And like I had a degree and there were simply no jobs. So I think emigration is very much part of the fabric of mm. Irish society. And I suppose I always knew that I would leave. And in fact, all my siblings have left at various times. Like my sister lives in New York and she's been there, God, 21 years. Mm. My brother lived in Prague for a really long time, like he lives in Ireland now. Um, Taig, my youngest brother, lived in Australia. Um, Rutan's the only one who never kind of lived anywhere else, but she went off around the world for a year. It's, it's just, it's what you do, mm. unfortunately. Um, and like at the moment, well, in the last four or five years since the economic crash, again, like waves and waves and waves of young people uh, have mm. gone to Australia, to Canada. Um, some of them have started to come back now, which is nice. Um, but yeah, it's like the kind of the lot of an Irish mother you know, to wave your children goodbye. You've been with Tony a long time. Yeah, hang on till I think now. Yeah. What year is it now? Yeah, we've been married 20 years this December. So, um, your, your, so your family is quite family. It is. How does, how, does, how does Tony find that? Good, good. I mean, it, like, because we have, like, we're blessed in that the in-laws are also very nice. Like, um, you know, last Sunday he went walking with Liliana, my brother Niall's wife. You know, just the pair of them went off. Or, you know, him and Rishan's husband, Jimmy, will do walks. Um, or, or, you know, him and my brother, Tyg. Um, no, we're all, he, he's grand, he doesn't feel overwhelmed. You know, and I worried about him initially because he's very quiet. You know, he is, he's shy and quiet. Yeah. <laughs> And because we're very rowdy, the Keyses. Yeah. So it took him a while to kind of find his place. But no, it works very well, touch wood and everything, you know? Um, so um, there's a lot of. Oh, sorry, there's the, the phone. Sorry, the postman knows oh, the postman. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of chests of drawers in this house, <laughs> Marion. <laughs> there are. A lot yes. of chests of drawers. <laughs> yes. And on your Instagram feed, there are lots of chests of drawers. Yes. Tell me about the chests of drawers. Oh my God, all right. Well, you see, I can do, never do anything by halves. I am either on or off. I have no dimmer switch. So I started upcycling furniture. Well, that's the fancy word. I call it banjoing, uh, <laughs> where I take a piece of furniture and basically make it worse, um, you know, by painting it and then distressing it. and. I started last summer and it is just the greatest joy um, because I love bright colours and I get some horrible owl, you know, crappy owl thing from, you know, some second hand shop and I'll paint it bright pink or silver and then put on fabulous knobs. I'm queen of the knobs. I'll show you my knobs. Fabulous knobs. Um, so, 
But because I'm so obsessive, I can't stop buying the things. And there's this site called Done Deal um, that it's, you know, they, people sell their old furniture on it. And I promised Tony that I wouldn't buy any more, but I slipped and it was like an alcoholic going into an off license. You know, I went on Done Deal and suddenly I saw like this fabulous mahogany set of bedroom furniture somewhere in Sligo. So I did some slyer phone call to your woman and, um, and bought it on the sly. It's not like you can smuggle it into no, the house and hide it like in the back of the No, and it's not like a pair of shoes. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, but I mean, he's so... And in fairness, he climbs feckin' mountains, you know, and puts himself in, in danger of debt regularly. So, you know, a little yeah. bit of give and take, you yeah, know? Exactly, what's the few chests of drawers, drawers. Friends? Yeah, and like, it's bad at the moment. I admit it's bad at the moment, but soon there'll be a shipment out. Um, you know, there's a charity shop that I give back the, the, the banjoed things to when I've made them silver and put the pink knobs on. Um, and I've a couple of commissions. Yeah. Have you? Yes. Well, one of them is from my nephew, oh, baby right. Teddy. <laughs> yeah, or oh, not yes. real commissions. So no one's no, paying like, me. Yeah, yeah. 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 And you I've will made, commission me. Yes, commission. exactly. Yeah, 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 but like I'd hate to have an actual commission because I mean, I, I'm it wouldn't be fun slap then. dash. Yeah, like I just lash it on. And if there are mistakes, and there are plenty, like it doesn't matter, you know, but if it was for somebody real, I'd have to be going around and tidying things and cleaning things and going with the white spirits and all, and that's not me. I'm very lazy and I'm, I, I like instant gratification. You know, I don't like the fiddly stuff, but I love it. I, I just love it. You know, it's one of those things like, where like to have a hobby is a bit kind of, you know, nobody admits to having an, a hobby because it does kind of, it's a bit stamp collecting. It is isn't a it? bit yeah. train spottery. Mm -hmm. um, but I just I lose myself totally in, you know, and funnily enough, it's a great thing for sorting out worrying thoughts or, you know, naughty problems or getting to the heart of why I feel upset about something. Because so I'm there painting away and there's nothing to distract me. Like I don't have. Sorry, that's the radiator. It's the radiator. <laughs> yeah, this house is full of funny noises. Um, yeah, I don't have any like music on or anything. So yeah. it's a good authentic yes. Bit of soundtrack. Yes. It's good. Yeah, this is an old house with crappy plumbing. You know, so it's very it's temperamental. It's a bit diva-ish. You know, it says bit of attention now, please. I'm just going to make some noise. <laughs> You were, I mean, your Instagram feed is full of your chest of drawers and nail varnish, um, but you're, you're a Twitter animal, aren't you? Really? You've got 92,000 followers on Twitter. Y you see, oh God, I love Twitter. Because um, my publishers were always at me, you know, to be doing, they said, social media is the way to go. And I was like, no, I just, I don't know, I thought it would take up too much time. And, and I was right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, down the Twitter hole yes. for three hours. Oh yeah. my God. Um, and I resisted. I mean, I actually, I have never been on Facebook. I don't know how it works and I don't like the sound of it. Um, <laughs> what don't you like the sound of? I kind of, it seems really showy offy. You know, that people are all doing their lovely holidays and stuff and their beautiful children. And it seems very kind of people only show the perfect aspect of their lives and leaves everybody else kind of in a kind of a, a frenzy of jealousy and self-loathing and friend loathing. Mm. And I don't like how people call each other hun. I, that, that word, I can't bear it. Um, whereas Twitter, I don't know, like a duck to water it was yeah. because I am all about the words. Um, like I love conversation and the thing is I don't use Twitter for work um I mean and I I just I have the, the crack you know I have such a laugh and people I find you're, you're the creator of Pole Dark Bingo oh, I mean <laughs> yeah but that's again that was born of the Twitter community um I feel very much part of a community and it's very we wish each other well, it's very, there's no meanness on it. Um, so you don't get any problem with trolling on Twitter, do you? I get the odd bit, I do, oh, I do, fun. I do. Mm. And then it's funny now, um, the other day, 
um, the woman who stole my life was part of um, a radio book club, an Irish one. And I just went on Twitter, you know, as usual, one afternoon for, you know, a bit of crack. And suddenly there was all these men, like, saying, what are they doing reviewing pathetic chiclet on? And I, you know, like, so there was a fair amount of misogynistic stuff coming my way. And I did feel like saying, well, actually, if they were reviewing a book that was written by a man, would you be so fucking annoyed? No. Like, would you kind of direct hate their way? Um, and were they subtweeting you? Were they putting you they in They were the putting street? my name in it so that I knew. Nice. So, yeah, lovely. 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 Yeah, and I just think, what yeah, kind of complete knob me. are you yeah. that you feel good about spreading your vitriol? Um, yeah, so I really despise people who, who would do that. You know, who would who would let somebody know? It's hey, I'm slagging who, yeah, you. I'm slagging By the way, you off, just need yeah. you to know. Um, it's those people who I hate. Those people who need you to know that someone has said a bad thing yes, about you because I just thought you should know. Yeah. Why? why? Like why? My yeah. life is not better for knowing that. Yeah, exactly. You know, I I really don't need to know. So, mo but mostly Twitter for me is an extremely happy place. And the only thing is, I don't, it's funny, having been told to do it for work, I don't really bring work into it at all. Mm. And so when people say, hello, can you follow me so that we can talk about doing an interview? I think, no. no. Yeah. And so I just say, I'm here yeah. for the crack. Yeah, you know, my publicist. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, also I think that's quite lazy. I mean, I can't say I've never done it, yeah. but it is quite lazy, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So you have in um, Jennifer Weiner, am I pronouncing that right? Weiner? Weiner, I think, yeah, but I'm not sure. Um, the the no American novelist um, really gets into it with Jonathan Franzen over the kind of the reviews. Yes. Stuff. And he has, um, he's been very critical of her being on Twitter, using Twitter as a tool oh. in that way. Have you not, fo have you not followed no. any of that? No. Oh, you should, you should check it out. Right. But it's fundamentally your experience with the Irish Radio Book yeah. Club. It's yeah. like women's fiction not getting reviewed because yes. it, if it was written by, by a man, it yeah. would be. I mean, what would you ever, would you, would, would you ever want to take that further, get involved in that on a bigger level? Um, right. You see, I mean, we live very, I mean, it's a patriarchal society we live in. And I feel that there are more important issues, feminist issues, um, mm. to be addressed, dealt with, than the fact that women authors do not get reviewed with the same respect or the same um, frequency that male authors do. I think, you know, it's certainly part of the patriarchal continuum, but I would rather fight bigger battles. Um, you know, I would rather focus on the fact that rape convictions are so low and that sentencing is feckin' risible. Um, I, and I do think Everything needs to shift, but I, th I don't think we can do everything. So I think it's a question of prioritizing what is most important to us. And domestic violence is far more important than people like me saying, but the Nina didn't review my book and they reviewed the Nina and my Nick Horney, you know? <laughs> like, it is all part of the same fundamental yes. problem um, that our society is constructed in a hierarchical adversarial way um, which is extremely male you know and it's why why women who have children um, miss out on promotions because they ca they have to step off that hierarchical structure whereas I think if women ran the world if it was a matriarchal society it would be far more consensual. You know, there wouldn't be that kind of layering and, and, and there wouldn't be a kind of a zero sum um, job situation. I think it would be very different. So I think, yeah, there are fundamental 
incredibly, it's so huge that most of us don't even see it. The, the way our society is structured is so hostile to women. Um, so I've, I've sort of gone off on a tangent, but yes, I tangent. feel, I feel ire that women don't get the same respect in anything. Um, and, but I personally am not going to complain about my circumstances because there are women who have it a huge amount worse. And I don't want to take the focus from them. That's amazing. Thank really? you, Marianne. A pleasure. For talking to the pool. Oh, that was I am. Really brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.